Hello, Paris Scorch. You're very welcome to a special Golf Weekly. Hey. Oh. 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 I knew the moment they saw us for the first time, we'd get that reaction. Golf Weekly listeners are just the best, Joe. Nathan Murphy, hello. How are you? Uh, we are here in Paris Court. We've had a brilliant day. We've played the East Course. We have, uh, I presume, some friends of the pod here, yes? Yeah. Our thanks to Halpenny Golf, they gave great prizes. Yeah. As did uh, Paris Court, they came through for us in a big way. Uh, we're going to get into things. There's a few bits of housekeeping. We're here to launch uh, the Off the Ball Open. Yes. It's a big deal. It is. You want to tell people about it? Well, you should all know this. It's everybody here today will have uh, this leaflet in their little prize pack, in their little gift pack that was uh, brilliantly put together by our marketing team. So as you'll know by now, some of you, I hope, are going to be coming with us to Abu Dhabi, 17th to 23rd of November, 2019. It's a five-day trip. It includes, Joe, return flights with Etihad Airways, five mm -hmm. nights in the four-star Crown Plaza, two rounds of championship golf, uh -huh. the National Abu Dhabi Golf Course, and the Yaz Links. Uh -huh. Welcome drinks reception. Peter Laurie Golf Clinic. Approach with caution, I would say, on that one. <laughs> Off the Ball Roadshow, Gala Awards Dinner, Airport Golf Transfers, Golf Buggy, and Golf Bag Allowance. So, I mean, everyone gets a golf buggy? No, not to keep. Not to keep? <laughs> it's an allowance. You should, oh, that's, yeah, okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Don't focus on the negatives here. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering how it all works out. How do people come on this trip? Well, it's very simple, Joe. You just check out CassidyGolf.ie. Simple as that. Very good. And there's a bonus today for coming along? There is. Everybody here got a little bonus, got a little discount on the trip. Just look inside your goodie bag. There's a discount in your goodie bag. We won't ruin the suspense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how did you play today as a matter of interest? I haven't asked you. You know, you know there, were, there were good moments and there were moments where I contemplated what is the point of all this. I know. I had Many of, of those moments. I had one of those days as well. So oh the yeah? less said about our golf, the better. Um, we'll get things moving. So later on, we're going to be joined by four-time winner on the European Tour, Ryder Cup player, the winning put against Ben Crenshaw at the 1987 Ryder Cup. Eamon Darcy is going to be with us, and we're going to have a chat to him about his career. Uh, but first... I mean, we try and get the biggest guests. Listen, every time we come and we do a Golf Weekly outing, we always make sure we've got European Tour winners. Peter Lowry. Yeah. He always turns up. He does. We decided to just up it slightly this time. This is the big one. It's never going to get any better. No, this is it. 15 majors. <laughs> <laughs> Dear God. For crying out loud, 15 of them. It's, it's incredible stuff. He burst onto the scene in 1997, winning the Masters. What? Yeah. And as you would have seen, just two months ago, he won the Masters he again. This is the big one, everyone. Special guest, he's flown in. Live in Golf Weekly. Live in Golf Weekly. It's Tiger Woods, everyone! <laughs> Tiger, it is amazing to have you with us. You played today the Paris Court East Course. How did you find it? Well, the conditions were really, really tough out there. And, uh, but I, I thought I played good. Uh, I putted well. And, but my back is pretty bad. And uh, that's from carrying Nathan all day. God, <laughs> man, you suck. <laughs> wow. R really, really suck. Wow. <laughs> that's harsh. Uh, he is very welcome. <laughs> Connor Moore is here, everyone. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> hey, amazing to have you with us. You've got a nice week lined up. How good are you? 18. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> huh? In fairness, it's not surprising uh, <coughs> people think you're an exceptional golfer. Anybody who tuned into Ireland AM yesterday would think that you're uh, an expert, that you're well able to give guidance on the game of golf. Tell well, us what happened. You see, well, it's Instagram, isn't it? And it's like a blogger, you know, like a girl who's a blogger. She's not going to put up ugly photographs of herself. She puts up the best ones. So on Instagram, I put up my best swings, and I don't put up the crap ones. And most of them are crap. So a lot of people think, because I have a decent swing, but it's very wayward, that I'm a very good golfer. But again, I'm 18. So Ireland AM were like, will you come on and promote the, the Irish Open? I was like, yeah, sure. So I didn't even look at the email. About two days ago then, <coughs> I swear to God, two days ago then, I get this uh, email saying, can you send us on your putting tips? I was like, what, <laughs> I was like, what do you mean putting tips? I, I was like, I says, what are you talking about putting tips? So she, the producer rings me. And she's like, yeah, we need your putting tips. We want to make up a graphic and all, you know. And I was like, why, what's going on here? She goes, you're giving putting lessons on television. <laughs> I swear to God, I, was, I, I said to her, I was like, you do know what I do, don't you? I was like, I'm the, like a comedian. 
She goes, yeah, but the lad said to see you on Instagram and stuff and you're a really good golfer. <laughs> anyway, I shot 101 in Mullingar on Saturday. <laughs> 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 and 13 hours later, I gave a put and less on television. <laughs> Your life has changed a lot, it's fair to say. <laughs> bit, yeah. This is all a bit surreal. Hey, you told an amazing story. We're going to Tiger and all that stuff in life now, but you just told a mad story, and I don't want to forget it, about uh, doing, I guess, a corporate gig in front of Jack Nicholas recently. Yeah, I mean, the Players' Championship was on, and it, obviously it's the PGA Tour's big event. It's their big, the fifth major or whatever. And uh, <coughs> I ended up doing a gig in the, the commissioner's house. So you rock in, it's like the great Gatsby's house. You know, it's all you know, hors d'oeuvres, all this kind of crack. And I was in there anyway, and I was... Sorry, what kind of crack? Uh, or, did I say that right? Hors d'oeuvres, <laughs> is it? It just shows you, yeah. But, um... And who's there? Sergio was there, Jack was there. It was funny, actually. I was standing there, and I was drinking a glass of water, and I was waiting to go on. And I turned around, and there was Sergio. And so I looked at him, and I was like, oh, well, what's crack or whatever? And he looks at me, he goes, hey, man. And he kind of looked that way, and I was like, Jesus, he either hates me or he doesn't know who I am. So then I was like, right, I'll just turn around and introduce myself. So I, before I got my hand out, he just goes, <laughs> 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 And he goes, he goes, man, the impression's really good, but what's with the laugh, man? <laughs> he goes, apparently his wife, when he gets taken home and stuff like that, she's like, <laughs> just to piss him off and stuff. <laughs> but he was great guy. But anyway, I did, I did the gig then. I went up on stage and done the gig. And the commissioner had like blown me up big time anyway. And he was like, and he told Jack Nicholas, he said, Jack, you've got to come to the front and listen to this guy. So Jack is standing there, the commissioner's here asking me the questions. So I start off, the first four impressions, everyone in the room is laughing, but I kind of feel like Jack is like just kind of watching it, you know, he's like, you know, I don't even know if he was even, whatever, like he just, he was smiling, but he wasn't laughing. And I had no intention of like sneering Jack at all, because I was too afraid to like, because he's, he's like God. Hmm. So then after about four impressions, I was doing Bubba, and I'm, and I'm crying, I'm like, oh man, you know, and I'm doing this, and then I look, I was like, is that Jack Nicholas, man? And I'm like, man, Jack's the greatest golfer of all time. And everyone kind of clapped. And I was like, you don't believe me? Just go ask him. He'll tell you himself. <laughs> <laughs> and literally the whole room went. <gasps> <laughs> and it only lasted about two seconds, but my whole career flashed before my eyes. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. And then he laughed. The whole room laughed. And then it was just, the gig went brilliantly, whatever. So after the gig then, I was chatting to him for a couple of minutes. What's he like? So, just a class act. Like, really is a class act. So I told him, I said, you've caused so many rows in my house. I said, because me and my brothers grew up like Tiger fans. So Tiger's the greatest player that ever played the game. We didn't even know anything when we were younger about Jack. Yeah. And my dad would come in and go, Jack Nicholas is the best of all time. And there'd be serious rows in my house. And as in like, we'd be just going at each other and we'd be fighting with my dad saying, Tiger's the best and this, that, and the other. So I was telling Jack this. And I was like, my dad is like your biggest fan. And he was like, whatever. So we were chatting away anyway. A couple of days later, I'm back in New York and I get this email from Jack's manager and it's like, what's your address? So I give him the address or whatever. And I was like, they must be sending me something. So mm. he sends me a picture of me, Jack and Barbara. And my dad's name is Tom. And in it, dear Tom, thanks for all your support, Jack Nicholas. Cool. And I was like, Classic. like that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, <coughs> like, were you there when your dad opened it? No? No, I sent it home with my brother or whatever. So he got it. I was going away for his birthday, but then I was like, you know what? I'll just send it to him now. He was actually, and literally, he, it is his sporting idol. Yeah. You know, so he was... Amazing. Uh, it was something money can't buy, you know what I mean? But it was a real touch of class from Jack. Such a touch of class. Like, there's yeah. no payback for that. Oh, yeah, nothing, like, you know, know, he went home and thought of that. Mm. Do you know what I was in? And he's meeting people every, like, all throughout the day that are telling them, you know, it's such an honor or whatever. But he literally went home and made that effort and got those, the pictures printed, mm. sent to him, and then signed them. He signed one with me and him as well, just to me or whatever. But, uh, yeah, a real touch of class, yeah. Mm. Have you ever been overawed by any of these great sports people you've met? I was overawed meeting Joe all right today, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, don't, I don't think so. Like, you know, it, it's amazing the more you do it. I suppose when I started off, I, I, like, I started off doing the GA stuff. Mm. And the first guy I met was Joe Brawley. And I remember being over in RT going, Jesus, Joe Brawley. I know. <laughs> 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 but like, I remember, I mean, sat down and we had like we did the gig and or i did this video with him and i was just chatting to him and the more you get to know these people like sure it's like meeting anybody yeah do you know and it's like the less you talk about golf to them i think the more they like i'm sure yeah you, know, you have the crack with them well, for you 
like where did all this start? The first time I kind of saw you was at Joe.ie. That was where you first kind of popped into my world. We, had you been like an overnight success after five years of practicing day in, day out? Or like how did this all come about for you? No, literally it was a, a fight in a GAA match. And it was very, very random. And my family are very passionate people. And uh, when I say passionate, they're always rowing in GAA matches. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my cousin got into a row. And uh, me and my uncle were there. And the entire team kind of jumped on him. Were you playing? No, I was on the bench, whatever, I was injured. Um, <laughs> but uh, me and my uncle then, we were like, it was just kind of, it obviously, it's a family member, so we jumped the fence in Cusick Park, and we got involved. So and my mother rings me up after, and she's like, I heard there was a big, huge row. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, I was like Ned and Eddie and I were involved, and everything. I was like, it was shocking. She was like, were you involved? I was like, no, it wasn't. So the newspaper comes out on a Wednesday, and there's a picture of me like this. <laughs> <laughs> with this fella from the Downs, whatever, from this GA club. And then I was... Uh, uh, they were going to suspend me or whatever. And in the end, then, nobody got suspended because they cited wrong people, something like that. And I literally had seen Snapchat had this face swap app. So I literally did a, a video then of Joe Brawley going, you know, those moors are absolute tramps, so they are, you know. <laughs> and I sent it into the group, and the boys were like, geez, that's brilliant. And even when I look back at it now, it wasn't good at all. Right. It, like, to the standards that I, I'd have now. And the boys were like, you've got to put that online. And I was thinking, but sure, it's a, it's a, it's a row in a Mullingar. No one's going to care. Yeah. But the next day... I did a thing called Off the Ball with Woolley was working with you at the time. And I did Woolley, Colin Parkinson, interviewing like Davy Fitz and all these boys about the championship. And it got like 60,000 hits. And the guys from Joe rang me up and were like, come up to Joe, we want to talk to you. We might have a job for you. Wow. So I walked up and we're in the meeting with Niall McGarry and Paddy McKenna. And uh, they look at me and they're like, so show us your stuff. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? They're like, you know, what else have you got? I was like, well, that's it, the video you've just seen. That's literally all I have. <laughs> And they were like, well, this is a waste of time. We thought you were impressions. So I was like, yeah, I am. I was like, yeah, well, like, I was kind of trying to convince them. I was like, if you literally give me the job, I, I promise you I'll get better at it and all this. So they gave me a week to come back with Premier League impressions. So I did. I sent it to them. And the boy was like, no, he's not good enough. And they didn't give me the job. And uh -huh. I was like, I was so disappointed because I was selling phones at the time. I was one of those people, you know, you know, I could save money off your phone bill. But I was robbing you at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, <coughs> So I was literally in a call centre doing this kind of crack, and then I was like... And what age were you then? 27. 27. But they gave me a week to come back with impressions, and I seen in the week the improvement on some of the impressions, and I was going, if I work at this, I could, like... Mm. So literally, the next day, I, I said to my mother, I was like, I'm going to set up my own page, and I'm going to, you know, go at this stuff. And she's like, oh, fair play, did that, brilliant, yeah. And I said, yeah, yeah, I quit my job there yesterday, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> she said, you did what? I was like, yeah, I quit my job. And I literally quit the job, and I just started making videos. And, and that up, was it. Up until that point, up until you do that Joe Brawley video, had you been a guy who was taking the mick out of, your, out of your mates, doing impersonations? Had you, you know, was this like 10 years of you practicing this without noticing? Because it's kind of remarkable that you'd be so good at it without even trying it before. <coughs> to be honest, no. Literally, like, I, my friends were like, Jesus Christ, like, you're able to do that? Like, my best friends, no one really knew. When I was a kid, I watched Apria Match live at the yeah, Olympia. Yeah. My dad got this DVD, and I was sitting there watching him hysterically laughing, and I was going, like, it must be funny, my father's laughing at it, so I thought it was funny. And I started, like, kind of doing impressions of them yes. and their impressions. But I'd say I didn't do an impression for about 12 years, except doing my uncle down in my GA club. He'd leave the dressing room, and I'd be impersonating him to the boys, like, taking the piss out of him or whatever. But uh, That's unbelievable. I didn't, but kind of how I got good at it was I'd listen to music a lot. Like, so what I did with my phone was I was going, I listen to music about two and a half hours a day, like, between the bus and, you know, sure. commute and stuff. And I was like... So I deleted all the music, and I downloaded just people's voices. So when I'm walking around town in Dublin, I have earphones in, and I'd be like, oh, man, the conditions are really tough out there. People think I'm talking to someone, but I'm walking around doing the impressions, practicing, listening in my head. I was doing Harrington one day, actually, and this girl walked up. She knew me from Mullingar, and she was coming up behind me or whatever, and she was about to stop me and go, oh, well. And I was, like, walking along going, yeah, sure, it's great. You know, it's great crack. You know, I delight with that and all. <laughs> and she kind of stopped, and she starts walking after me. She says, what? What are you doing? I was like, I was on the phone. She was like, to who? I was like, oh, sorry. I was, and I was telling her then, I was like, literally. And that's how I think I got wow. good at it. Like, literally. So instead of, like, listening to music now, I just listen to people's voices. And that was after you got the break at Joe, where you said, I need to get good at this. Not before. Oh, yeah, that was after, after yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. that video just came out of nowhere, and I kind of wow. seen this opportunity, and I was like, because I was working, and I was like, when, when I went up to Joe, I was, like, so excited, because I thought, I have this job. And then when I didn't get it, I was so disappointed. You weren't enjoying your previous job? No, I actually was. I'd like, 
we had a great old laugh in there, me and the boys, like, mm. just sitting there selling phones to people. Is the coverage good? Oh, yeah, you have 100% coverage down there and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And I wouldn't mind, when I left then, I think there was some sort of inquiry about some milk I sold as well. I was delighted I got out of there in time anyway. <laughs> I think I was about to get the chop. Yeah. Uh, would you have been regarded as funny by your mates growing up? Because there's the do the impersonation, and then there's you actually have to write funny stuff. Like the Apre Match lads can do both. You, you have to be able to do both. Yeah. Uh, like funny, not so much, but if me and the boys seen something funny happen, and we met people, and they were about to tell the story, they'd stop and say, you tell it. Because I was kind of, I was okay. a very good storyteller. When I was in college and stuff, I'd be kind of the guy that people would be sitting around and I'd be like, half ah, it's lies, obviously. That's how you're a good storyteller. So yeah. <laughs> but um, I was kind of the storyteller in my group, yeah. So that's a good sign that you're kind of on the right track then, or that you had a funny bone there. Yeah, I think, and I grew up like a very GEA, like I grew up in a dressing room, like, so I've got kind of like, like when I do a video, I kind of think, would the boys find that funny? Mm. Do you know what I kind They're of your audience it? in your head. Yeah, and I have like my two brothers and stuff, and one of my mates, Paul Christie. I'd send them stuff all the time, and they're very honest with me. Okay. Like they'll be like, that's shite. And Don't have you a good out. sense now of what's going to land? Like if you make something, do you know this just works? Because we all get kind of good. We mentioned Instagram. People get very good at knowing what stuff tends to get likes, what doesn't. We have an algorithm going on in their head. Are you getting pretty good at understanding what's going to go viral, what's not, and why? Yeah, well, my kind of strategy is. Like, I won't do a video for no reason. Like, I won't just, you know, tonight put out, like, 30 impressions and be like, look at this. I, I, it will get views and likes and stuff, but if the World Cup is coming up, yeah. or the Masters is coming up, it was like, like, I had the, video, the idea to do the Masters video pff, two months before it. Now, in fairness, I had to learn a bunch of new impressions for it or whatever, but the whole idea was put it out on the Monday of the Masters, and that's the best time, because people are thinking about golf, and I still do that, like, with the Golf Channel. I still you only kind of put stuff out when it's topical, because the internet's like that. The internet is very much what's topical yeah. works. It doesn't, you could have a brilliant piece of comedy, put it on the internet, and it kind of has no context, and it would get lost. You could have something that's not really funny at all, but it's about something that happened today, and people will share the hell out of it. Okay. And it kind of just works like that. Right. Had you any sense of how successful the golf side it would become? Because you understand in Ireland, GEA is huge. Premier League football, you can understand why people would want you to do Premier League impressions. Golf is a little bit more niche, and when you go away from Tiger, Rory, there's very few golfers who actually the general public recognise. Yeah, no, it, when I did the golf video, I remember I was working with Joe at the time, and at the time the GA got really big and the soccer was getting big, and I was kind of getting itchy feet, because, well, they were paying me my wages, so I was exclusive to them. So people were com coming in and asking me to do stuff, and I was kind of like raging, I couldn't do this, that, and mm. the other. So I went into McGarry, and I'm McGarry and Paddy, and like, Paddy, we were only talking about there recently where he was like, geez, I remember that meeting where I was sitting there at the table and I was like, I want to do a couple of things here. I want to do a soccer video. And they were like, you can't do that. Like, I wanted to do it on, on my own page because I was making content for them. Mm. No, they were paying me, so that's the name of the game. Sure. But I was kind of going, I was looking at other people and I was thinking, like, he's 300,000 followers, like, you know, and I've like 10,000. I was like, how is that? And I'm getting millions of views. But I was never doing the content on my own page. So I asked them, could I do some stuff? And pretty much it was like, oh, you can't do that because that, like, it's a conflict here and a conflict there. And one of the things I asked was to do a golf video. They were like, why do you want to do a golf video? <laughs> and I was like, I think, I think it could be big. Now, in my head, big, I was just thinking of another source of income. I was thinking like golf clubs around Ireland, in the UK, maybe even America, they'll bring you in to do impressions or whatever. I didn't know what was going to happen like when I did that video. Just exploded. Oh, it, was, it was mad. It was, obviously, it was last year at the Masters, and the thing just like took off. I was sitting there in the house, and my phone kept like, going off yeah because it was just like trickling and trickling or whatever like a notification after notification and then i went to bed i woke up the next morning and my phone was just like stuck and it kept getting stuck but sergio was after retweeting the video okay and he was like man this guy's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and is, is and and so the golf channel ring you and say <coughs> come work for us yeah the boys brought me over for the players championship last year so i went over and it was just it was like unbelievable like it was just as soon as I got, see, at the time, when I did the first video, they, ran, they emailed me and they were like, Let, we'll, we'll do some work with you, we'll do a few videos. But on the Saturday then, I put out a video of the boys in the locker room and kind of, instead of just doing the impressions, I showed them a sketch. Mm. Now, I, not directly, but it was like, I did it so that they'd see it. When they seen the sketch then, they were like, you know what, maybe we could actually do some really good comedy over, and then when I got to the Golf Channel, they were like, 
And I was kind of looking for a bit of direction off them, and they were like, you're not going to get any direction off here, like here. Like, we have 90 hours of live TV without a single joke all week. So there's no one going to help you here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, it's, it's up to you. It's up to you to do it. Like, which has been great. Like, they've been brilliant to work for, like, you know, and they're like, all about pushing me out there. And like, they, they really have. And they just let you at it. Like, you know, sometimes they're like, Geez, you can't put that out yeah. you know, after certain things. Because you've been in New York for like, the last, what, seven months? Nine months, yeah. Nine months. Drinking in the long hall. Uh, <laughs> Johnny Kennedy's pub. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, are you busy? Are you working flat out day in, day out? Or are you actually just having a good time and doing the odd video here or there? When I was in Ireland, I was like busy all the time. I was like, uh, I used to get up at six o'clock in the morning, go to the gym, and I'd like kind of treat my week like a normal working week. And then when I was in America, the last nine months, I was like going to bed at six o'clock in the morning. So it was just like, <laughs> it, it was definitely different. Like. So I, went, it was, it, like, I went off the beer for 10 weeks before the Masters. Right. I did loads of work. I did a racing video with Paddy Power. I did the Masters video. I learned some new impressions. And then the Masters came, and I came back, and I'd say I was on the, I'm, sti I'm still on the beer from about then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it difficult when you're working for Golf Channel then to work on demand? Because you obviously just started out, well, 18 months doing the golf impersonations, that you could pick your moments, you could build it up, you could have it all planned exactly the way you want it. I guess Golf Channel wants you to churn it out. So is there any <coughs> worry of quality control at any stage? Um, no, like, they, if I, like, there was certain videos where I was like, well, like I did a Bryson video recently of him around the house. And I remember after it was edited, I was like, and they were like want mad to put it out. And I kind of felt the impression wasn't there and it was a, like, I don't know, I just wasn't happy with the end product. So I just said, listen, I don't want that going out. And they're literally like, fine. Like they're, like, they're unbelievably brilliant to work for. Right. And, they li and the guys that are dealing with me like are just so accommodating. Like, and again, they, they look at it and they go, you know what you're doing, yeah. so you just do it. The call comes uh, one way or another about Tiger Woods. Yeah, did it? I don't know. I was literally in Mullingar, I was after, it was after the Ryder Cup. And the Ryder Cup was like just massive because I did the video for the, the European team. And uh, when I did it, I didn't even know the boys were watching on the Monday night. And Tuesday morning, I wake up and my phone's going mad because Poulter said like, yeah, you know, Connor done a video and it was, uh, it was hilarious. And, it, <laughs> and he was like, I don't think you're going to get to see it. But, uh, you know, and everyone then was looking for this video. And it was mad. There was, someone took a picture of the television in, in America. There was a picture of the... It was like USA versus Europe, and the back of the screen was a, a split screen. On one side of it was Michael Jordan, that the USA brought him in, and the other side of it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Who got the victory? <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, did that, and I remember leaving Paris, and I was like, I was like, Jesus, like this is unbelievable. Like, yeah. I, the whole week was just magical. Like, and about a week later, I was Sorry, at home. Sorry, I remember bumping into you that week. Yeah, yeah, well, I met you too. Yeah. yeah. Hang on, did you say you were going for dinner with Nick Faldo one night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was just to annoy you, because I <laughs> yeah, Oh, no, it did, it did. It's it all did. we talked about that we, night. Because I think we were walking along uh, the 18th, and we spot, spotted this Irish guy surrounded by two of the wealthiest-looking Americans I have ever seen asking for a selfie. <laughs> um, no, I remember that, yeah, we met, yeah. I, I kid you not, I swear to God, we were working really late that night. We sat, like, in our little bed sit, no sharing, lie. like, you know, shoes off, the smell of feet, eating KFC, going... I hate that guy. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I was doing? I was literally saying, no, oh, take that wine back. I want some else. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually did have dinner with Nick Faldo? Yeah. Now, he brought me, I, I, he, anytime I'm in the area or whatever, him and uh, Lindsay, his partner, always bring me off like, for dinner and stuff like that. Like, he's good crack. Like, he actually is a good They, like, laugh. adopted you or something? Sort of. Yeah, well, listen, they've a lot of money, so you can adopt me all the want. <laughs> 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 What's he like? Because he had a bad reputation on tour for not being very friendly. Quiet, bit... Dead so he's like yeah. he's a laugh. Yeah. He really is a laugh. Like you know, he's just good crack. Like you know, he's. I actually had dinner in his house there at the Players Championship and stuff, and like he was giving me swing lessons. I was showing him my back swing. He's like, mate, that's a swing and a half. And I thought it was a compliment. He was like, half a swing will do because I I go very <laughs> far back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, after dinner with Nick Faldo and the Ryder Cup, when does the Tiger thing start? Yeah, what happened was Bridgestone followed me on Twitter. What do you think? 
that's more money one way or another. No, I was like, oh man, they're going to send me some free golf balls probably. Yeah, you okay, know? good. You know, the, the whole Instagram thing. So I followed them back and then I got this message, uh, can we talk to you about an opportunity or something? And I was like, I literally, and I genuinely thought, I'm going to do a little thing for them and I'll get paid and I'll get some golf balls or whatever. Mm. And uh, my agent rings me up and she's like, she's kind of hysterical on the phone. <laughs> and she's like, Bridgestone are after contacting us here. And the subject is potential opportunity with Tiger Woods. And when I heard it, I was like, oh my God. But I, I genuinely, and I'm not saying this, but I actually didn't really believe it and I didn't let myself get up. Because mm. I was like, so I was asking him, I was like, does Tiger know about this? And they were like, not yet. But we're going to broach it with him in the next two or three days. And we're going to talk to his agent. We actually reached out to his agent just, Bridgestone were saying this, we reached out to his agent just about an hour ago. So we know in the next two or three days. And within about three hours, I got this email back from the agent going, Tiger's up for it. Wow. And I was like, Jesus. Like, So we end up... Uh, I ended up flying to Atlanta. No, I ended up, yeah, flying to Atlanta on the 10th of December. And we did the ad. It was just unbelievable. And in the build-up to that ad, like when you're playing around with the concept or you're coming up with ideas, like do you come <coughs> up with that idea or do they say, look, we've come up with this. Tiger's giving it the okay. This is what we're doing. Is there much playing around? Because comedy's, you know, that, that, that bit different. There was a bit. I kind of thought I'd be a bit more involved in the, the writing of it and stuff, but I wasn't. So I was given these scripts. But when I was looking at the scripts, I was like, like, I can do an impression of Tiger, but if I don't say the conditions are really, really tough out there and like really good and putting well and these kind of Tigerisms, well, how am I going to come across as Tiger? Yeah. So initially I was looking at it, it was all about the golf ball. It was like, oh man, this golf ball's groovy and this kind of stuff. And I was looking at the script and I was like, I, I, I got there to Atlanta the night before and the director was like, he was kind of saying the initial idea was Tiger would be kind of stoic and wouldn't really respond or like laugh or whatever. And I was kind of thinking like, he's got to laugh. You know, so when we got there, he, every time I looked at him, I was like, uh, and I delivered the line, conditions, oh man, yeah, because the conditions are really tough out there. And he would just break down laughing. And he's like, God, man, you sound just like me. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the parts was at the end, the, the director said to me, he said, just go and give, do, do Tiger to Tiger and start messing with him and say stuff. So I was like, really? And he was like, really? I was like, really? And I was like, that's what I said. That's what I said. Really, really. And we're doing this thing back and forth. And at the end of it, then I go, oh, man. And he goes, dude, I don't say, oh. And he starts laughing. And literally, that was the, they put that into the ad. Yeah. So it was a natural kind of reaction of his to, oh, dude, I don't, I don't go, oh. Yeah. How did you sleep the night before? Who did you bring with you? Give us the kind of behind the scenes. <coughs> um, I rang Bridgestone up. And my brother's a huge Tiger fan. And it was coming up to Christmas or whatever. And he's always doing stuff for me. So I was like, this is... And my cousin, when I go out to America, always puts me up in the house. But he's the type of guy who reminds you of how much he does for you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? He's like, you know, I brought you here and I, I, you stayed in my house six months rent-free. All this kind of stuff. So I was like, I'm going to put this to bed. <laughs> That's your best impression. <laughs> 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 but uh, so I said to Bridgestone, I was like, listen, then... Um, I'm a bit nervous about going on my own. And uh, like in truth, I wasn't really like I was mad excited for it, but I was like, mm. could I bring me manager and me agent, you know, for a bit of company? They were, of course, yeah, no problem at all. <laughs> so I rocked up with the brother and the cousin then. They were my manager and me agent, I think. <laughs> but uh, it was funny, your, like your brother's basically like your twin. Yeah, no, he's very like me. And uh, Tiger said that as soon as he walks in, he's like, God, dude, he looks just like him. But my brother walked in and like I knew bringing the two boys, they wouldn't be like, oh my God, Tiger, and like they're cool mm. enough, so I knew they wouldn't do that. So they walked in, and Tiger was just sitting there, the hat on backwards, like it was just on his iPad, and he comes up. But when I walked in, I said, welcome, but I went into the room then, and I was in the room, I was looking out, and my brother walks in with my gear bag, and I seen him looking at Tiger, and Tiger just stands up and goes, hey, Tiger. And my brother's like, I know. <laughs> 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 and then he's looking at me and I'm like, oh, fucking hell, man. <laughs> but um, he was just so, he was class. Was he? Because, I mean, that's the, the, the thing, and I look, I appreciate you kind of, you don't want to tell tales or whatever, but the new softer tiger, the nicer tiger, everybody's, a lot of people would have read the book we talked about on the podcast a lot. There's just so many isolated stories of him being a bit of an ass, like in a very casual way to basically everyone he meets. And I don't know if you went with that slight worry, I hope he's not an ass. What's he like these days? No, obviously he, like he has a reputation of being kind of uh, guarded in a sense. Sure. But um, when I went there, like that book or whatever, I never read that book because I didn't want to read it and like have this idea of someone that I don't know. Mm. And when I went there, he genuinely was, one, he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. 
like and that's no joke he was like so he was very engaging like when you were talking to him like he would like he'd always have to, I was talking I was like oh my brother's living in London oh and well, what does he do and then all of a sudden 15 minutes later I'm like I'm after shouting on about my brother to this fellow for 15 <laughs> minutes yeah. and I was like and he would just like he was just class and I was so you felt he was listening to you <coughs> he was engaged in the conversation he was massively yeah. yeah he was like and even with my brother like my brother set up his own company and stuff and Tiger was over like giving him like advice and everything and he you know and then he was giving me a bit of golf advice I was telling him Last year, the, the captain's prize in my club, so it's the big, the big uh, competition. And I only kind of really started playing golf last year. I played a bit before that, mm. but I was more into the GA stuff. So I gave up playing football last year. And my uncle was the manager of the team. I think I was getting dropped anyway. He was delighted when I said to him, I think I'm gonna like <laughs> pack it in. He was like, oh Jesus, no. And then I <laughs> <laughs> but apparently he was behind me back. He said, you know, he made an easy decision for me there. You know? <laughs> but uh, so, I started playing loads of golf and I got into this really rich vein of form last year. I was off 20 and the, ca the captain's prize was on and I went out the first day and I actually was, I went out the night before and I was mad hungover and I woke up and I was lying in bed and my dad was the captain of the club. So this is his big, big day. And I look at me watch, I'm like, oh shit, I'm, like, I'm late. So I go into the brother, he was out with me and we're playing together and I'm like, get the stuff, come on quick. So we drive out like a million miles an hour out to the golf club. I run up to the tee, throw the bag down. My father's there getting a picture with every single person that tees off for the captain's prize. And he looks at me and he looks at the watch and he goes, what's this? And I was like, I, 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 and he goes, you're an hour and a half early. And I was like, what? I'd read the tee time wrong when I was in the bed. I was like half dying or whatever. <laughs> so for the first time ever, I warmed up. So I was like chipping and I was like putting, so I had nothing else to do for an hour and a half. And uh, my brother actually went in for the cure. I think he two Heinekens. He played terrible when he was <laughs> But I ended up shooting the lights. I, I had a 68, an 86, which was my best score at the time. So right. I was a 66 net. And I was leading qualifier going in. And I was playing against all these guys that had been trying to win this for years. And I was telling Tiger this, because he was asking, do you play much golf? And I was telling him about the captain's prize or whatever. So all week, my driving was pretty bad, but my putting was great. And all week, I was like, if I get the driving right, like, I'll murder these boys. I was like, I'm off 20. <laughs> like, so I stand up in the tee box and I'm saying to myself, I stand out in front of people all the time and all that, like, oh, pressure, what pressure? So I get up the tee box and I drive it smack right down the middle. I mean, it has to be impartial. He's like, oh, best of luck. And he's there when I'm walking up, he's like, come on, I'll do it. You know? <laughs> so it goes down the middle and I pitch onto the green and I'm about 14 feet above the pin, downhill, uh, downhill pull. And I stand up and I, I actually was walking to the green and in my head I was like, what will I say tonight now for my speech? <laughs> I was like, I was looking at the two lads I was playing with, like, and there were two like former captains and stuff, and I was like, Geez, I'm gonna murder these boys. I was like, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden I hit the, f I, I don't know what it was, but I stood up in the tee, and I was grand, and when I stood up in the tee, or not the tee, sorry, on the green, and I grabbed the club, my hands were like this. <laughs> and I was kind of going, like, what is wrong with you? I was like, you know, I don't care, I'm not a golfer, I'm just here having a crack, just. So all of a sudden I hit this, but it goes about four feet in front of me, another four feet, and then I literally, it rims the hole and goes in for a tree putt. So the second hole comes up, I tree put that again. And I was telling Tiger this on air, I was like, and he In was this kind of detail? Oh yeah, no, we, were, sure, we were there all day, sure. Yeah. We were there, <laughs> time. What else would he be doing? <laughs> but I was like, so I had this tree put, and I was like, I lost, uh, I lost it. He's like, dude, it, it can happen. You know, first club championship, and uh, you know. You get, championship. He's like, you know, he's like, you know, get nervous, and that'll happen, you know? But, you know, experience, and you'll, you'll be good. I was like, yeah, I was like, I lost it by three shots. He goes, oh. And I was like, I had nine tree puts and a four put. And he goes, fuck, that's a lot of putts. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, my, my brother was there. My brother's always telling that story. And he's like, I swear to God, boys, Tiger was disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> he, was like, he was like, fuck, that's a lot of putts. Oh, uh, uh. uh, dear. And I gave a putting lesson on TV on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, have you got Tiger's number now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> who, so you, who are your golfers that you do? You do Tiger? Justin, you're Justin Rose, good? Actually, I was at the Open last year, and it was obviously my first Open Championship. And I was walking along, it was a practice round. Yeah. So I'm walking along with uh, one of the girls from the Golf Channel, and all I can hear is, you know, a lot of ebbs and flows, peaks and valleys, you know. <laughs> so, but I'm not worried, I'm an Olympic champion. So and I look around, it's Justin Rose doing my impression of him to no me. Way. <laughs> yeah. um, they all seem to take it well. They all do, yeah. Anyone, well, anyone trying to take it well, but secretly not liking it? I don't think so. Not that I've met. No, Sergio was a legend. 
Because I would have thought yeah. Sergio as well would take himself very seriously. I thought Poulter was going to take himself seriously. I actually, <coughs> now I pre record some of the videos. For at the Open last year, then I had a pre record ready to go where I was doing David Feherty. You know, Feherty does yeah, the, yeah, the Golf yeah. Channel mm. stuff. And he was like the psychologist. And Poulter was like talking about the US Open. I just got a member and it was a big shambles. And yeah, he's yeah. like, you know, that's, uh, you know why they made it so difficult at the US Open, don't you? And he's like, oh, why? And he's like, yeah, because they're trying to stop me from breaking Jack's record. <laughs> you know, and this kind of, but <laughs> Poulter missed the cut. And then that video was scheduled to go out and it went out uh -oh. and I was like, oh uh -oh. shit. Uh -oh. He's going to think like I've literally just Put kicked him when he's down. Yeah. And then this tweet comes in, he goes, this guy is hilarious. <laughs> 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 and literally he's been, he's been an absolute, we're trying to get something going with him, a video and stuff. He'd be always tweeting me and stuff like that. Like, yeah. you know, he, he really like just gets a buzz off it. Like, and sometimes I'm like, have I took the piss out a bit too much? <laughs> and when you think he does, then he'd tweet out the video and he's like, this is, you know, funny. What about Bubba? I actually thought Bubba maybe didn't take it well, but someone from the Golf Channel told me, he's like, man, dude, that guy has me down. So he's like, but the crying and all that, um, that actually, you know Rory's stories? Yeah. When I was doing the video last year, I didn't have many Americans in, and it took me ages to get Tiger. My brother was like, you've got to get Tiger. Yeah. And he goes, if you... So I had to sit in my room for four days because I gave up on Tiger because I didn't think I could do him. So I sat in the room for four days and just done him. And then I, uh, Rory's stories was like, so who have you got in the video? And I was telling Rory about it, and he was like, uh, what about Bubba Watson? I was like, nah, I don't have enough time to learn how to mm. do him. He says, all you have to do is like, have him crying. Yeah. So literally, the video comes up, and it's like, <laughs> Tiger talks, Sergio talks, and then it comes to Bubba. He's like, yeah. <laughs> and all the comments then were like, man, that Bubba impression was spot on. Spot on. <laughs> <laughs> literally, I couldn't do it. Now I can do him now, but at the time, I couldn't do him, yeah. The four days in your room, are you literally watching Tiger Woods talk, try and imitate Tiger Woods talk, or are you looking for the equivalent of the Sergio laugh? Because you can get a spot on impression of someone or you can do like the Bubba Sergio thing, which is like a slightly unfair twist on them. Yeah, well, it, it, it all depends. Some characters give you that and some don't. Yeah. But like I try to get it as close as I can get it. But then you got it like Poulter, I could do maybe even better than I do. But it's funnier when it's, oh yeah, for sure. You know, <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, then I remember doing Joe Brolyak gigs and I was wondering, I was like, it's not that funny. People don't really, but people are kind of looking at it going, wow, it's spot on. Right. But like when you're in a room like this, like do I want people to go, wow, geez, that's spot on? Or do I want people laughing? Yeah. So you want people laughing. So it's more important to be funny so w so than how accurate. So give us Broly and what, like, how Broly is kind of... Well, you know, Jude talks like that, you know, and he talks a lot of shit, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. But when I, like, when I was doing him, I was doing it like that. Yeah. So now at gigs, it's like, well, you can totally forget about him as far as he's a man. So you yeah. kind of do it that way. And it's funnier, like people laugh more at it. Like, so it is kind of... You just have to find that balance where, like, I wouldn't do someone if I didn't think it was, like, close enough. Yeah. And then when you, and sometimes I like to get it to as near as I can get it and then work backwards on it and find where it's funny. Broly loves it. Oh, he loves it. He can't get enough. <laughs> <laughs> so his name on the internet and stuff like that, he just loves all that crack. <laughs> <laughs> He's brilliant, though. He's become, like, a really good friend and stuff, you know. Um, he, and he, maybe if I didn't meet him that time, I don't know what way I would have went because he was tweeting the videos out when nobody, nobody was. Okay. Do you know, so he was like straight from the off. He was a, a fan of the Connor sketches, a fan of the pod. Because so. he, he did the Sunday game that time. That was a really good one. Yeah, he got me, he got me into that. He did was he, walking yeah. past the, the, um, the room in RTE and he was over there doing something and he goes, what are you all doing in here? And this was Sunday game people. They're like, oh, we're trying to think of some ideas. He goes, I have a brilliant one. Get your man Connor sketches to come on and you know, let him rip me out. The people will love it. <laughs> So it was his idea. They were like, great idea. So they brought me down. I think got like a million views or something like that. But he loved it. He yeah. was like texting me for days. You know, they're still texting me. He goes, and he was like, it's going to 700,000 views, Paul. It's going to 800,000 views. It's, going to, it's after going a million. This is unbelievable stuff. <laughs> Who's next? Uh, I have to sober up and think about that one, don't I? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, like at the minute, well, the Open, it's, it's condensed this year. Do you know? So the Open... I have a couple of videos for the Open uh, to come. Yeah. And I suppose after that, then you'll take stock. Like, but you'll be looking at next year nearly. Do you know? Because most of the videos will be done. and you, d you might get a couple of stories before the end of the year. You might get two or three videos out, but you're not going to get much. So Gary Player, I've done, and that one, like, when I do that, you know, because Player, yeah, I tell you now, absolutely great. He's got that. <laughs> <laughs> He's hilarious. You know, it's like, I played the Masters Championship in my first one, 1872. Right? And it's like. <laughs> and it, 
he, he had live gigs, like, it's mad even Molinari was, when I did the video for the Ryder Cup team, um, I'd never done Molinari before. So they sent me this kind of script at the, the European tour, and I was like looking at it, I was like, ah. So I just wrote my own script and sent it back, but there was a couple of players I needed a little bit of info on, and they were like, oh, Molinari's just deadpan. And I didn't actually kind of cop any of this. So then I did him in the video, and obviously if you've seen the behind the scenes video, like he was just laughing, the boys were all laughing at him. But uh, that now at live gigs, like I just stand there, Oh, it's so great to be here. You know, <laughs> it's just amazing. And you just do that and everyone's hysterically laughing. But like it was, again, some of these things, you just fall on top of them, you know? And it's yeah. yeah. Your Premier League stuff is off the charts as well. Thanks, Joe. Holy moly, it's so good. Like, Jesus, that must go global big time as well. Like, th is that a different level to golf? No, the golf, the g uh, for me, nothing really tops the golf. Right. Like, I, I suppose maybe it's America, I don't know. But the, the soccer's brilliant and stuff. But when I was growing up, I was like playing GEA and stuff, but I was more into golf. I'm into soccer as well, I'm a Liverpool fan, mm. but I'm not hugely into it. Okay. So I'm not always watching it. And like, it's like when you're doing this thing, you have to be, I, I think you have to be interested in the sports you're doing, because then it's not really work. Mm. Like technically I could tell you, oh, I have to go and work tomorrow, I have to like watch the US Open or something, technically. I know it would make you sick, wouldn't it? Technically it's like work. Yeah. Do you know, I, for me, but it's not, because I'd be watching it anyway. So the soccer, I like doing the soccer and it is a good, it is good, but like the people online are just mad as well, like when you're dealing with the soccer fans. Yeah. Golf people are so polite, like if they thought it wasn't a good impression, they're like, I didn't think his like Jim Nance wasn't very good there. But soccer fans are like, die you fucking, <laughs> whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you like doing in the football? Mm, pff, Mourinho. Give it to us. <coughs> I'd prefer not to speak, I have nothing to say. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. Him, I do a bit of Klopp, do Rio Ferdinand is kind of popular. Harry Kane. I just want you to do all these people now. Ha you want to do Harry Kane? Yeah. yeah obviously, it's a uh, club, <laughs> it's yeah, and uh, it's a million, and uh, you know, it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Kane definitely doesn't like your Harry Kane. <laughs> What's mad is I'm actually mates with a couple of lads that are mates with him, and the boys, <laughs> did you get me to send videos to different people? Like, give me some of this, whatever. And like, I sent one to Justin Rose one day, and he sent one back. And then one of the boys was like, "Oh, send a thing to Harry Kane." So I was like, I sent it to him to send to Harry Kane. Then he was like, "Man, I'm not sending that to him." He was like, <laughs> 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 uh, "So what does the future hold for you? Are you gonna stay here, or are you gonna base yourself in the States? Do you know what the I plan is?" I was in the is, States or? for the last nine months, and yeah. I came home last week. I kind of came home like to practice, because I'm playing in the Pro-Am on Wednesday, and I don't want to embarrass myself, but I think it's kind of <laughs> that ship I sail. <laughs> <laughs> um, I fear for you. I'm playing actually Donaghy tomorrow in the Atlantic, Wild Atlantic shootout. Um, and if he loses to me, like after what you've seen out there today, it'll be very, very embarrassing for him. Yeah. So we're looking forward to that tomorrow. But in terms of the future, yeah. I don't know. I don't think too much about it. Do I you just not, really? No. There's no strategy, there's no long term. Uh, there's a stra like in what I do week to week, and I'll always have goals and things like that, but like I don't be like I have to do this or I have to do that because I kind of find like things just happen, and random things happen, and you know I might go into another game or two. I might look at different sports mm. that haven't been maybe touched before, things like that. But um, for the minute, just enjoying it. Like it's I, it must be the most surreal thing. Like, do you find yourself in? I'd say you do in certain situations, thinking, "What the hell is going on here?" Yeah, sometimes uh, it's. Some gigs, like I was doing a gig for Michael Dell in his house one day. He's Dell Computers, like, <laughs> it, he's worth like 20 billion. And, uh, just in his house, just, we you, were just you and Michael on his own? No, actually, he, he had all these CEOs from all over America, and you're shaking this fella's hand, and the fella's then in your ear going, no, he's worth six billion, and this fella's worth this and that, and you're walking around. But I was in the house then, and I did this gig for him, and like, I find here, like, if I start sneering you and you, everyone in the room is kind of laughing at it. Over there, not as much. Right. So I like, I was in Michael Dell's house and I thought it would be wise if I started snaring him. I think, but I, I don't know, it was like, no one really was laughing, everyone was kind of like, oh, like looking, and then I was like, so I just cut it short and just kept going. But the gig went really well. Yeah. And after he was like, he brought me down, he was like introducing this person, that person. I kind of thought it was funny then. I was like getting a bit cocky and confident and I was sitting there and I was drinking a glass of wine with him and we're sitting at this table and we're like, uh, he's like, so what are you doing tonight? And I was like, we're gonna go into Sixth Street, which is in Austin and we're going drinking or whatever. I says, you should come down with us, me and the boys. And like Johnny and a few of these lads. He's like, oh, I don't know. I was like, ah, come on. They're doing $2 whiskeys, man. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody in the room got it, or nobody at the table got it. Everyone was just like, 
looking at me and I was like, Jesus Christ, it was a tough crowd. <laughs> no one got it all. He was like, oh, I, I, I don't know, I don't know. He like took it seriously that I was saying $2 risk. <laughs> <laughs> um, Have you any concerns about those Bridgestone balls? Because they weren't really dropping today. <laughs> a couple of putts slipped out, I will be honest. Uh, I was unlucky. I was close enough to breaking the course record, but I'm happy with my 98. <laughs> <laughs> I was good crack. It was great crack out there today, and I have to say, playing with Jer and Nathan here, uh, we kind of panicked after. Uh, after about 11, we realised like we were, weren't in the prizes, yeah. so we had our own little game then, which Johnny and the murderers, I think four or five mil or something, did it, didn't they? Did we win any holes? No, we won one hole. Oh yeah, where I actually, I actually knocked it in, eight iron, si six feet from the pin, and he ended up getting a par, and I ended up bogeying the hole. <laughs> so I three put. <laughs> Another three put. It's a lot of three puts. A lot of three putts. That's <laughs> a lot of putts. It's all right. At, le at least at the Irish Open, to be, I'm sure there'll be nobody following Niall, Niall Horan's group. Yeah, that's yeah. the problem. It's going to be a bit like Niall playing with Tiger Woods. Yeah, Jeez. you know where you're the guy. They're not there to see you. They're there to see him. But you're going to feel the pressure of the crowd watching you and stuff. So that will be a good crack anyway. Like you know, have you, pl have you played one before? A pro am no. I only played Lynx golf for the first time about three weeks ago. In the <laughs> oh <hitch>. God! <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I went down. We down did. So Paul McGinley we was chatting to him, and so he got me in the pro am. And he's like, uh, so do you want to play La Hinch? And I was like, yeah. So I, I came home from my brother Stag, and it was, I literally got La Hinch on the worst day of the year. Like, I mean, we were nearly blown into the sea on some of the holes. And I was looking at the caddy, and you have this impression about Lynx Golf that it's really tough. And I was looking at the caddy, and I was like, I, the wind was coming into my face, and I was walking like this. And I, he was only there, but I had to shout. I was like, is it always like this down here? <laughs> <laughs> and he was kind of laughing, going, oh, this is the worst day of the year. But in my head, I was kind of thinking, Jesus Christ, Lynx Golf is hard. So I probably will embarrass myself. If, you're, if you want to laugh, I think I'm off at 2 o'clock on Wednesday. <laughs> Good to know. Listen, um, thanks so much for doing this, because I know you're busy and you're down to doing beg tomorrow, and um, it's great to have you here, because I think everyone's just watching you do amazing things, and it's, it's amazing, it's brilliant, and everybody's uh, big fans talking to people when they knew you were here. It was like, great, I'll definitely stay for the dinner now. <laughs> so that's always a good sign. Um, st stay sitting, actually, because we're going to bring it Eamon Darcy and chat. Sure. Are you to go? Yeah, do. Okay, but a round of applause. Conor Moore, everyone. <laughs> And with that, you might give our next guest a warm round of applause. We'll keep going here, and we'll get some uh, thoughts on the Irish Open. Uh, Four-time winner in the European Tour, four-time Ryder Cup player, uh, famously part of the 1987 Ryder Cup on US soil. He uh, held the winning putt against Ben Crenshaw. Uh, delighted he's here. It's Eamon Darcy, everyone. <laughs> Hey, Eamon, Nathan. Well, how are you? Good. Hi. Eamon, thanks for coming on. Very welcome. Yeah, no, it's great to have you with us. We've never had you on the pod before, so it's a nice place to do it, nice uh, part of the world to do it. You're nearby here, aren't you? I didn't have far to come. Yeah. <laughs> no. You're, you're living nearby? Just there at the back gate. Okay. And yeah. is, th is this where you play, or are you knocking around I sneak spots? in here every now and then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were playing today, I heard. I played nine holes uh, with uh, Bernard Gibbons. Do you know Bernard? No. Okay. It's a bit of a cul-de-sac probably there. Uh, <laughs> and how are you playing? Are you hitting it well? I was hitting it too often. <laughs> <laughs> I presume the thing everyone says to you is about your swing and about the uniqueness of your swing. I hope you're not going to say about my swing, are you? I am such a fan of <laughs> your swing. I mean to do what you do, and it, it's just so your own, and it was unique. Uh, when, like, I presume, did you ever have a lesson? Like, I, it just seems like it's totally homemade and natural talent, and you've almost created it yourself, in a way. I created it, all right. It was just, uh, I guess it was something I was born with, because um, nobody could uh, teach anybody to swing it the way I did. No, it no. wouldn't have been best practice if you were a pro teaching a kid. No, but you know, it's funny you should say that now, some of the teachers are starting to teach some of the guys to take it a little bit more outside the line than they used to, you know? So maybe somebody has been watching a few of my old videos. Yeah. Well, it's funny, I was uh, on like page three of Google or something ridiculous last night looking up bits about your career and somebody has written a big long, you know, broke your swing down phase by phase and made the point that yes, it's, you know, you'll know more than me obviously, but up, very upright and steep and looks a bit quirky, but then actually from kind of here towards impact, you're in all the good positions. 
could you give us a breakdown of what you're doing, or do you, is it like, I don't even want to think about it, I just do it? Well, you know, people talk about swings, and uh, um, you've got guys who have very pretty swings yeah. that can't play at all. And then you've got guys like Connor. myself. <laughs> <laughs> you've guys like myself that look at quirky looking swings. There's a few guys out there now, um, Jim Furyk. We, we swing it very similar, but it doesn't matter what you do around here, it's what happens at the ball. And it's, you know, for any of you out there who don't swing the club sort of like um, Tiger Woods, Tiger got a lot of mention tonight, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. um, that doesn't matter, you know, because I have an old saying, every cripple has his own way of walking. And, you know, if, once, you, once you get into the impact, it, the, it doesn't matter what you do. Mm. You were uh, saying there that it was a swing you were born with and obviously had it from such a young age. As you were growing into the game and as you're in your teenage years and you're becoming more successful, were people, coaches, people around the game putting you under pressure at any stage to change it? There was a very famous golfer called Henry Cotton. And he was one of the best golfers I ever saw. But he ruined more good players um, by trying to teach them. And I used to go down to him in Portugal for a few weeks um, back in the 70s. And he used to say to me, he used to call me Laddie. He said, Laddie, whatever you do, don't listen to any coaches. Just do your own thing. And it's true. For me, for me um, to change my swing back in the 70s, when I started playing well, I would have had to go off the tour for about two or three years mm -hmm. and completely rebuild my swing. And um, I didn't think it was worth it. Did you ever try and rebuild your swing? I did, but it never worked. Um, I used to look at myself in the mirror and I think, yeah, that's good, that's good. And then as soon as I put the ball down, I'd go like this, you see? All habits die mm. hard. What, was you, what were you thinking? Because you're, you're, look, this is just full of golf nerds, okay? There's a lot of very, very, lot of very sad people here, so they'll kind of want to know. When you're on your takeaway, like, were you thinking I'm keeping my elbow higher? No. No thinking? Don't think about anything. All I think about is what kind of a shot I want to play. As in visualize the... See the shot, you know? Right. I mean, if you, if you don't see the shot, it's very hard to play it. What was your reaction the first time you saw it on camera? Shocked. Really? Shocked. When was that? I don't particularly like watching myself on, on camera. Um, back in, back uh, in the 70s, a good friend of mine who does a bit of commentary for Sky, a South African guy, he saw me playing in uh, Madrid. Yeah. And he didn't believe it was me. He saw the golf bag saying Eamon Darcy, and a friend of his, John Bland, uh, said, yeah, that's Eamon Darcy, Ryder Cup player. This guy said, no, it can't be. And he followed me down to the first tee and listened to the starter saying, from Ireland, Eamon Darcy, because he thought, this is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you first time um, went on the European tour in the 1970s yeah. and started very well. Like in 1975, you were third in the Order of Merit. Yeah. In 1976, you were second yeah. Order of Merit. Yeah. Seve, yeah. the only player ahead of you. And across the 1980s, you were in the top 30 Order of Merit on eight occasions. So there was a great consistency to it, yeah. which is the amazing thing. Was there, was there ever kind of um, amongst fellow pros, were they saying, what are you at? Or, 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 do they understand that it was actually a great swing? Well, I think, you know, the pros, they don't really talk about the, your swing. The, you know, when you start playing and you start shooting some scores, yeah. people forget about your swing. Okay. They just want to see how you are inside. They think this guy gets under pressure, he's going to choke or do something. Didn't matter how good you swung it or how bad you swung it. Mm. If it's just that feeling in your gut that you were able to handle it. So that's really more what the, the pros would talk about. That guy's very solid under pressure or he's not so good. Mm. You know? And yours held up under pressure? You won four well, times? I, I, was, I, was, I won 22 times. Four, oh, did I you, sorry. I won, I won, yeah, I've won, uh, I've won um, four times in Ireland and 18 times worldwide, yeah. Right, excuse me, sorry, I yeah. read four European tour victories, yeah, but it's no. obviously, I know you played in New Zealand and different tours as well. I played Africa, New Zealand, yeah. Australia, I played everywhere. Right. I was like, have bag, will travel. Mm. What was that like in the 70s and 80s? It was great. 
Really? Absolutely great. I loved it. Um, my old pal, Christy O'Connor, God be good to him, we went everywhere. We had, we had a great time. You know, to enjoy a sport and to get paid for it, it's great. So, um, yeah. We were do I don't, Russia was, no, I played in Russia, but um, if there was a tournament anywhere, we went and played. We were like the hard guns. Yeah. Planes, trains, automobiles. Absolutely. Yeah. And what was the tour? European tour, worldwide tour, what was it like mid 70s in terms of how players were looked after? Was like, I think everyone remembers the Irish Open of the early 80s and the middle 80s when we'd all the superstars over and it, it felt like the center of the sporting universe at that stage. Was, was a lot of golf like that in the 70s? No, I mean, g golf in the 70s was, was, wasn't was great. The tournaments were small, um, not so many of them. Uh, that's why we had to travel worldwide. but. As, as television came on stream, uh, the sponsors came more on board to, to, uh, to get involved. Mm. So it probably wasn't till the late 70s when Europe got involved in the Ryder Cup. Um, we used to play in that Ryder Cup, it was Great Britain and Ireland, and we used to get hammered every time. And Jack Nicholas had said to uh, a guy called Lord Derby, this thing is going to die unless we can bring Europe into it. And um, that was the start of it in 70, 79, Europe came on, came on board. And how do people in Great Britain and Ireland, golf people, feel about it being expanded? They loved it. They loved it because nobody wants to go and just get hammered every time. <laughs> and, you know, you can only take so much of that. So when guys like Seve and that came on board, the whole dynamics changed in the Ryder Cup. Yeah. What was Seve like? Seve was great. I mean, he was real flamboyant, and he—I mean, he was—he he, just—he did his own thing. He was a prima donna, but I mean, he was—he was great. I mean, everybody loved him. He was just—he uh, was a good-looking guy, and he—he won—he won golf tournaments. So I mean, yeah. what more could you ask for? Yeah, and the level of talent around the greens. Could you pick up stuff from him? Ah. Uh, he used to play shots that he was a bit like Tiger Woods. He could see a shot that nobody else would see. Um, where he and I would have been similar, would have been chipping. I was always a very good chipper at the ball. But um, no, he was, uh, he was fantastic. And uh, he just brought the game to a different level in Europe. Mm. That was quite an exciting time for European golf. Like you had the big five and you know, you'd Seve and you'd Faldo and you'd Woosnam and Sandy Lyle was there as well, and Faldo, I think I said Faldo. Like, mm. all of these guys were doing amazing things. It was quite an exciting time to be part of European golf. They were winning all the majors. Yeah. yeah it was fantastic. And um, just golf became bigger and bigger. Um, and that's why I guess today now that Ryder Cup um, is so big. Mm. And this week they're playing the Irish Open. They're playing for seven million, you know? Mm. Did you get on well with those guys? Like Langer as well was part of that. Did you get to spend much time with them, or was it uh, was there almost uh, well I we're we're the major winners and the rest of the rest? I spent more time with them when I turned fifty, when I played in America on the Champions oh Tour. Oh yeah, okay. That was like uh, you weren't in a fast lane. It was it was like going back. If you even though they play for great money out there, I still do. Everything had slowed down a little bit. People used to talk to each other. Right, because Faldo was not friendly as a player in his pump. I always found Faldo okay because um, people found him a bit obnoxious, but I found him that if he hit a good shot, he'd say good shot. There was no real sort of kind of small talk. Um, like I'd much prefer to play with him than Lee Trevino. Really? Yeah, I mean, Lee Trevino never shut up. I <laughs> mean, <laughs> he just, you, you'd have to, you have to put the earplugs in, you know? I mean, that's all he was, yep, 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 yep. And it was his way of... of, of Staying relaxed, probably. Yeah, yeah, it was his nervous thing, but drive you mad, he would. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know... Does Lee listen to the pod? <laughs> 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 but the well, if you didn't know, Connor's good friends with Nick Faldo, yeah, so yeah, be careful yeah, what okay. you say as well here. Faldo still struggles to find people to go to dinner with, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <he's> desperate, <laughs> desperate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're... <laughs> if you're buying, I'm there. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, what was Langer like? Because what Langer's doing on the Champions Tour now is beyond belief. Like he's still, there's not a pick on him. He's no, playing as well as ever. What kind of competitor was he? 
Well, Langer is very, very religious. Yeah. Um, he wouldn't be somebody now you'd be ringing up to go out and have a pint with. But uh, a very, very nice guy, mm. an incredible um, competitor. He's just, his goals, they haven't changed. He's been, he's been winning now since for 40 years. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. And still when he plays like in the Masters, he'll pop up as well oh on the leaderboard. Yeah, I mean, they must hate him in America <laughs> on that Champions Tour because he, he steals all the money, yeah. you know? <laughs> and like, it's very hard to compare or pick the best. Who, like, who was the best two or three if you had to pick the best two or three that you got to play with in person? Because I always feel bad with all these players that we mentioned. We didn't see enough of them in their pomp. Who stood out for you as the top two or three? Do you well, want to I mean, Jack, Jack uh, Nicholas was, has the best record. Um, it's Connor's dad's favorite player as well, yeah. which is important. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, <coughs> he won 18 majors and he was probably second 18 times in majors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to take that away from him. Uh, but do you agree, you know, people say Jack was the best champion, but Tiger was actually the best player in his pump. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Jack couldn't hit shots that Tiger would hit. Right. And um, but he didn't have the clubs either, did he? I suppose back no, then. No, no, that's yeah. that's true. That's true. Mm. But I mean, to, to stand on the tee and watch the two of them playing, and they both hit a shot. You go when Tiger hit a shot, you go, wow, a bit, a bit like um, Rory. Mm. You know, was Jack just more? And I use this term, uh, you know, advisedly. Was he just more solid? More solid is correct, and less he, spectacular. Yeah, well, he was spectacular in a, in a way, but um, he was just he knew he knew what was happening, and the big occasions never got to him, like Tiger. But um, Tiger obviously had more problems with his body, mm. you know. Um, Jack didn't hit it as hard as Tiger, mm. but um, and who made you go wow out of the generation you played with? You know, if you're talking spectacular. There was a guy called Tom Weisskopf. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he hit a ball, you'd go, jeez, that's unbelievable. It, the ground used to shudder. And uh, you thought in your wildest dreams you couldn't hit it like that. Did I read Tom Weisskopf wanted you to come and play on the US tour? He did, yeah. I used to, on, I used to go shooting with Tom. Shooting animals? Yeah. <laughs> 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 we'll edit that out later. A startling revelation on they tonight's show. They hadn't heard that word back in those days. Uh huh. They hadn't heard of that word, shooting. What was it? But you were talking Hunting. about Hunting. Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah. Are we uh, talking about I, the I, same no, thing? Yeah, yeah no, for, for a <laughs> weird moment, honestly, I thought this was some golf thing that I hadn't yet um, <laughs> got to do. What? Was this like a form of the game, like the golf sixes? <laughs> uh, right, so you went hunting with Tom Weisskopf. Yeah. Yeah. Right, where what would you do? Where would you go? Well, we could shoot pheasants. <laughs> you, when you come up, when you come over here, you used to come over. Did shoot he shoot yeah. pheasants over here? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Didn't realize that. And he wanted you to come play the U.S. tour. He did. He thought I had the game to play it in the seventies. Um, do I regret not going? I probably do a little bit. Um, do you agree that you might have been better suited to the states? Yeah. Why? Because I had the type of game. I hit the ball very high. And I used to spin the ball a lot. And in the States, um, they play, back then, they played golf courses with much more water on than we did. Here, the secret was to hit the ball low mm. under the, with the equipment you had, you know, yeah. keep it low under the wind because the golf ball wasn't as good and, and the equipment certainly wasn't as good. It's more target golf in the States. Absolutely. And that would have suited you. Why didn't you go? I was probably a little bit nervous because I was doing so well in Europe and making a nice living. And I thought it was a big, big upheaval to go and, and do it. Right. Um, I don't lose any sleep over it. Sure. But I wish I had probably gone and uh, I had to wait till I was 50 to go and do it. And how did you find it when you went over then? Loved it. Right. Loved it. Biggest check I ever made in my whole life <laughs> was, it, was in the second tournament I played in, at the Mexican Open. I made 240,000. Where'd you finish? Second. Wow. You know? The Champions Tour, I mean, th that whole generation did better on the Champions Tour financially than they ever did playing. Oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was great. 
I wish I was 50 again. <laughs> <laughs> so Weisskopf is the one. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was... I mean, I'm, I, it's not like he's a nobody. He's an unbelievable player and, like, a phenomenon, but it... Yeah, it, uh, Palmer. I mean, Palmer was... Uh, he was he was exciting to watch, too. Sam Sneed. I mean, just... Sam was like somebody just starting a car. It was just pure genius. Yeah. It was effortless. That was the definition of a pretty swing. Yeah. Sam Sneed. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, he was mean. Was he? Yeah, to be, to be born with such a swing like that, you'd think he'd been a nice guy. Yeah. But... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Angelic, I would have thought, would have been. Yeah, like I, I played with Sam a few times, but I remember a story. Um, we played in Italy, the Italian Open in Sardinia, and we weren't playing very good. And I remember standing on the first team with him, said, Sam, we're not so good this week. And this young fella who was making up the third in the group, he was so excited. And he went up and literally he went down on his knees, said, Mr. Sneed, yeah. it's a an honor to play with you today. It's a dream come true. And Sam said to him, well, son, he said, it's like this. He says, you play shit and you draw shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Jesus. Slam and Sam was yeah. amazing. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. That's dreadful. Yeah. That's a good anyway. takedown. Because Sam, <laughs> Sam has the whole, oh, shucks, man of the people kind yeah. of vibe going on. Well, he was a real redneck, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Palmer, did you ever play with Palmer? I did. Did you? I did. I played with him, and um, the biggest tournament we used to have in, in Europe was sponsored by Colgate, and <laughs> I had the unfortunate that I was leading the tournament. It was the PGA at Sandwich, a great golf course, yeah. and it blew a gale on the, on the Sunday, and I shot 76, he shot 72, and he beat me. Right. So... Um, what was he like? He was, he, <laughs> he was a bit, uh, he was tough. He used to growl a lot, you know? And, um, yeah, he wouldn't sort of be saying, you know, he wouldn't be saying, did you enjoy your dinner last night or things like that, you know? It was just, um, he reminded me of my old pal, Christy O'Connor Sr. Yeah. You know, they just wanted to win everything. That's why they were so good. So he was in competition mode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah, know he was great. Where does um, we did a show out in the uh, at um, Royal Dublin mm. not so long ago, and um, Christie's a difficult one to put into context because it's very easy for people to say, "Well, he never won a major," and yet anybody who saw him in his pomp says, "You know, he was as good a ball striker and as good a player as anybody worldwide." And yeah. it's kind of hard to balance those. He two was things. he he was so good. I mean, I used to play with him every week. Um, on the tour, Christy Jr. and myself. And I'll tell you how good he was. Jr. and myself used to hit golf shots and he would look at us and he'd say, how can you hit a shot so bad? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, he'd say, what were you thinking of? It just wasn't in his armory. Right. They'd do that, you know? And he, he, he was a type of guy, Christy, he, he enjoyed the odd pint and if he was a little bit uh, unsure on his feet, mm. all he had to do was put a club in his hand, and suddenly he was like a pillar. He was so balanced. And that's the way he was, the way he, he was so natural. Mm. He put the club in his hand, and he just, he would do it effortlessly. Yeah. I, and would he, would he kind of hit it right to left, left to right? Could he do everything? Would he do both? He could hit it any way you want. Okay, all yeah. sorts. Yeah. Right. He had it all. So w in terms of, say, you have Weisskopf, who'd make you go, wow. Christie would make you go, wow? No. Well, Christie was like a machine. Okay. But a beautiful machine. And um, he would just know exactly where the ball was going to go. Mm. He probably, he wasn't a good putter. Yeah. That that's was his downfall. That's what's said, yeah. You know, and when you think about it, People say he he never won a, a major. Now he only he'd only play one major a year. When he was in his prime, it took a day or to go to America mm. on one of those planes. Mm. But um, he had his chances to win the Open. Didn't happen. But I mean, he's he's won seventy tournaments. You know. Yeah. 
I guess one of the things you're uh, remembered most for, and I mentioned it introducing you, is the 1987 Ryder Cup. And that was the first one that Europe won on US soil. Yeah. That's the one you flew out in Concord for the first time, yeah. and it was uh, Bernard Gallagher, was it? Who was like, we've got to do all this properly now, and we're getting no, jackets. No, not Gallagher, Jacklin. Jacklin, sorry, of course, yeah, yeah Tony Jacklin. Yeah. So he, he was the captain, he said, we're doing this properly. We flew, I was, I was telling uh, Liam with me tonight, we flew out on Concord, and um, the captain was a keen golfer, and he's coming in to land the, the plane, and he asked for a flyover, and he was refused. So he's putting this, I don't know how far it was off the ground, say it was a thousand feet or something, and then he was given permission to, to do a flyover. But Concord was so noisy. I mean, it was the noisiest plane. So he puts the foot down anyway, and up we go again. And he said, they know we're in town now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're flying around, and we go to different golf courses. And he said, no, that's not good enough for you guys. And eventually, we came to Muirfield Village. And he said, this looks good enough for you guys. And we're coming down, one of the fairways flying over it. And <laughs> Payne Stewart and um, Andy Bean were playing the 18th. And they saw this jet coming. And they thought, Jesus, this is World War Three, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that. Yeah, but when we, when we, when we landed, the typical American thing, they had the fanfares and everything. And we all had a, a white Cadillac with our own private number plates on. So we get, we get into these cars anyway, and driving down the motorway, the motorway is closed off just for us. We get down and uh, we play and we win. And on the Monday morning, we get up for breakfast. There's no breakfast. We head to the airport and we're stuck on the motorway for three hours. No way. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, they were really pissed. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that Sunday morning of the, of the singles when you take on Ben Crenshaw, it's your, what, fourth Ryder Cup at that stage? Yeah. And it ends up in your last Ryder Cup. Have you a good sense that Sunday morning that this is going to be your final appearance in the Ryder Cup? Because I know Ryder Cups have probably been quite difficult up to that. Um, did, did I think that, that was going to be my last Ryder Cup? Mm, that this was your, going to be your last day? No, I actually should have made the one after that. I was beaten by 52 pounds. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah, that's another story. But um, No, I mean, I just... Um, I felt uh, that team was so good, and I was somebody that obviously wasn't as good as our top players. And I just hoped that I was able to contribute something to, to the team, you know? Yeah. That's all you can hope for. And the guy I played against I knew very well, Crenshaw, lovely fella. And I didn't see it happen, and I, I, I didn't, I just showed you I was concentrating really well. He broke his putter. Mm. He hit it off, he hit it, he had an old putter, and he hit it off a cone, and the head fell off it. And if you do that, and it's your fault like that, you can't replace it. Well, I didn't think he'd broken it. I thought he missed a couple of putts with it. His one iron was his next best thing, that maybe this was a secret weapon. And people say to me, when did you know he'd broken his putter? I said, I didn't know. And that was true. I at any stage? At any stage. I just... I, I knew he wasn't using it, but I didn't know he'd broken it. And had he broken it out of anger, or was it just accidental? Well... I think there was a little bit of, it was a, a, an accidental anger. <laughs> 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 yeah, so. Um, um, How did he put with the one iron? He put it fantastic. I mean, the, I was about the third last match out, and we had a fantastic lead going into the uh, last day, but then it just went pear shaped. All the guys, not all, but nearly all of them were down, and we were. And all of a sudden, we looked like we were in big trouble. And the front nine, I played great. I, knocked it, I was out in 32, and I was cruising. I was three or four up, and I thought, this is great. And then all of a sudden, um, sort of the panic set in a little bit. And I went from three up to one down with, uh, uh, with uh, three to play, with two to play. 
one down with two to play. And people talk about my putt on 18, but it was my second shot to 70, and I hit a great shot up over the trees from about 180 yards with a six iron to about two feet. And that sort of, um, I think it on there, Ben, that I hit that shot. And um, I, hit a, I hit a three wood down the last, he went with driver, and he pulled it, and there was a little river running down. The, he went into the river and he dropped it out and he played a great third shot into the bunker. I hadn't hit my second shot yet. And I was going in with four iron, and I thought, now, just whatever you do, just try and get it onto the front of the green. But I hit it too low, and it hit the top of the bunker, I came back in. He was before me, and he hit a great bunker, shot out to about 12 feet. And the one thing you couldn't do with, on that green was go past the hole. It was like putting on polished marble. It really was. And I got in, I was closer to the lip and I panicked a little bit and I hit it out to about, still a good shot, to about six feet past. Of course, Ben being the player he was, he knocked it in with his one iron, so I had to hold the putt. And, um, well, we know what happened, it went in, but it was, when I got over the, people say, were you really nervous over the putt? I actually wasn't, I was, I was so focused but what I did remember saying to myself, just kiss this putt now, kiss it. Because if it doesn't go into the hole, it goes 20 feet past, it just won't stop. And you know, and it, it ended up being um, a, a sort of a real pivotal turn in the match. Yeah, and that's the point that ultimately yeah. wins Europe, yeah. the first Ryder Cup in yeah. American soil. Yeah. Is that easily the highlight of your career? Well, when I captained uh, Ireland to win the Dunhill Cup for the first time, that was pretty special too. Um, I guess doing things for the first time is always special. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Stop. You should come in there. Yeah. You should come in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done it. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> I can't oh, wait. Um, <laughs> who was the US captain that year? Was it? Nicholas. Nicholas, yeah. Did, did he say anything to you? Yeah, he, he actually, because I played Jack a few times in, in, the, uh, in matches, and he, he gave me a good old walloping, and um, it was nice to get a bit of revenge, even though he was such a great captain. Um, it's a shame that he was the captain and he had to get beaten, because there was a few guys I would have loved to have seen the captain. To, to be beaten, but I feel like we're warming up here, Eamon. Let's <laughs> start. Uh, <laughs> let's start naming names. <laughs> but he he put his arm around me and he said, um, he said, Eamon, that putt. He said, you're going to remember for a long time. It's so significant. And you know, I, I take things in my stride. You know, if it happens, it happens. But yeah. he was right. It was it was it was a big putt. Jack Nicklaus is coming across very well this evening, yeah. I would say, isn't he? Amazing. Because I'm sure he was sickened to lose at Muirfield as but well. But you know, the funny thing about that putt was, during the closing ceremony, <coughs> Sam Torrance said to me, um, he was still on the course, I heard you hold a good putt here on this green. We were standing on the green. I said, yeah, it was okay. He said, where was it? And I showed him, and he took a club out of somebody's bag. All our clubs were around the green. He took a club out, he hit it with one hand and went straight into the hole. And he says, I thought you said that was a tough putt. <laughs> <laughs> it's the pressure. Yeah. The pressure is the difference. Pressure. Uh, do you still watch a lot of the current guys? Are you keeping an eye on it? Oh, I do, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, I've retired from actually competing, but I'm still very active. I'm doing corporate days now, and um, right. I do a bit of work with, uh, with, with some, of the, some of the guys, you know, McGinley and these guys, to give me an odd call up and a bit of experience. Yeah. Who stands out? Who are the players you really like at the moment? Who are, who's going who's to dominate over the next five years? Well, I don't know about the next five years, but I'd, I'd love to see Shane Lowry doing well this week. He's playing great. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he's a big player. Now, it's a great field, but I just feel if the wind was to blow a little bit, which it mightn't do, um, he's got a big chance. Mm. What's the hinge like for people who haven't played it? It's a beautiful golf course. It's um, They've... They've made a few changes to it. These, these links golf courses depend on the weather, sure. you know, because these guys get stuck into them and um, they just 
they bring them to their knees. The only thing that saves them is rough and, and weather, mostly weather, yeah. wind. Mm. Um, it's going to be a great week. Um, I don't know who's going to win. They've got such a strong field there. They really have. They've yeah, thir 13 of the world's top 50. Is that what they have there? Mm. Oh it's oh good yeah. going for, It's you know, great. Yeah. It's great. Because the week after the British Open is the is a WGC, so it's hard to get them to f play four weeks in a row. They're not going to do it. Okay. Um, actually, funny you mentioned Larry, because Porter Carrington was on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he said something about Larry, which I just thought was amazing, really. He said the big issue he had over the first or the latter half of last year was that he broke his driver, his favorite driver, and he couldn't get one that just felt right. Okay. And I was kind of saying, but you're like, just goes into a, you know, into the truck and says, you know, I'll take any one of the 10 that you have there. And he was saying, no, no, no. It seems it's almost like impossible to get exactly the same kind of club. It is because, you know, we all use graphite shaft drivers and they're all different. It doesn't matter what the manufacturers say. They can set them up same swing way, we said, same yeah. spec, every way, but they feel different. So in your day, how often would you change clubs, 70s, 80s? <laughs> Didn't. We used to play with wooden heads, you know? Yeah. And, um, We'd no caravans around to, to say, oh, I don't like that, give yeah. me another one. You got a driver and it looked nice, you got to like it. And mm. the only reason you changed it was when it broke on you. Yeah. But um, no, it's, that's all changed. Yeah, I would have thought so. Yeah. What about uh, the Open at Port Rush? Yeah, that's going to be great. I mm. mean, um, who's going to win that? Oh, jeez, if I knew that, no, I'd tell <laughs> you. Um, Rory, I mean, he's obviously, he's thinking about. I don't know. He should actually be playing this week. I think um, this would have been a great build, build up for him for for Port Rush. He has to be one of the favourites. Kepka, I mean, all, they're all playing great, aren't they? Yeah. You know, and they hit it so far. That's the you know. I think I'm hitting it all right. And I played with Rory two years ago in Dubai, and um, I thought I was hitting it all right. Till I till I wa watch them hit these drives, mm. you know, it, it just it's a different game. Yeah. Where well do you think his game is right now? Because in one way you look at his season, he's won twice for most players. That'd be a brilliant season, but not really for Rory. And in the majors, it's been a bit of a letdown for five years now. I think his uh, his game is, is it's nearly there. His putting has definitely improved. That was the biggest thing. I saw. his wedge play and his putting. Um, it's funny, he's a real streaky putter. I remember Des Smith telling me he played, no, he didn't play, he watched a young fella down in Baltre 15 years ago, and uh, he hit this shot to the last green, a three iron, par five, up into the heavens, pitched onto the middle of the green, and he held the putt, and um, he said his name is Rory McElroy. I said, that's incredible. I said, is he, is he the real deal? He is, he said, but he's not a great putter. Okay, even then? Then. You know, I think great putters, you're born to be a great putter. It's hard to make yourself be a great putter. Right, because I had got the impression it was only almost laterally that he's almost tightened up with the putting and maybe started to think about it too much and it's not as free-flowing, but it's interesting as a 15-year-old, that's what Des mm. saw. Yeah, it's true though. Right. Some guys are just brilliant putters. Like if um, Tiger, I mean, Tiger, the best putter in the world. When he was winning, he was the best putter in the world. Mm. He used to kill guys. Mm. Just, he'd hold putts that you'd be happy to get down in two. Mm. It must be unbelievably frustrating for Rory to have that, you know, to hit these unbelievable shots and then time after time be missing these putts. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, <coughs> you can tell him I'm doing lessons. Ireland AM. Who did you give the lesson to? Uh, Simon Delaney, th the three presenters. But Simon's actually a good golfer. Oh, right. So I just said to him before, I was like, listen, whatever you do, don't ask me my handicap on the television. Because <laughs> it would have been a bit, because literally on the screen, my face came up and it said Connor Moore, impressionist and Amateur golf pro. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, there's a no category all to yourself. First off, there's, yeah, there's no such thing. 
And whoever did the research literally didn't have a clue who I was anyway. What were your five tips? Not uh, that anybody should listen to them having played with you today. I, I gave it the whole grip pressure thing. I was like, you know, you don't, no, not too soft, not too hard, whatever. And I was like, uh, <laughs> and then I was like, your, your alignment, you know, I was like, you know, pick a line there in front of the ball and hit it. And then I said, uh, you know, then obviously pace, if it's a downhill putt, it's kind of softer, if it's up, like this was basic. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of it then I said, and you just got to rock the shoulders. And Lisa was taking the putt, she goes, what? And I was like, oh, just hit the ball. <laughs> she didn't have a clue what rock the shoulders meant. <laughs> so I was, like, I, tell you, when you, I was like, I wasn't prepared for a follow-up question. <laughs> when you think of all those things, it's hard to hit a putt, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she drilled it a mile past the hole. I was like... Tell me, those greens out there today, did you play? Yeah. They're tricky, aren't they? Yes, I'm yeah. glad you said that. Yeah. Very tricky. But you had a great day. The course was great condition. That looks amazing. It wasn't yeah. the course's fault. No, no. It was really yeah. tough out there. What was, the winning <laughs> <laughs> what was the winning score today? 91 points. What? Yeah. From some lad off, like 22, 19, yeah. 21, and uh -huh. yeah, there we are. They, they, they've won a four. 17, sorry, 17. Oh. 91 points, so they did well. Some bandits, huh? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Listen. It's been great having you on. Yeah, Thanks so much for, it's great for coming here. and chewing the fat up. Yeah. Some amazing stuff. I'll never look at Sam Snead on YouTube the same <laughs> way again. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, and thank you again for coming. Appreciate Cheers. it. Thanks a lot. So, round of applause. Eamon <coughs> Darcy, Connor Moore, everyone. <laughs> that is... Uh, that is pretty much just done. We'll let you go. You've homes to go to. It's a Monday evening, half nine. Nathan, thank you. Sure, sure. Everyone, thanks a million for coming. As always, sure friends of the pod, we appreciate thanks it. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Come to Abu Dhabi. It'll be fun. And uh, we'll see you when we see you again. So thanks a million. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>